Okay, I guess we can hear me. Um, welcome to the <laughs> testing outside the box track. Um, I don't know where Sarah is. <laughs> so uh, I'm just gonna get started and hope that's okay. Um, yeah. So you might recognize this image. Uh, this is what actually one of four versions of Edvard Munch's The Scream. It's known as one of the um, greatest depictions of existential angst, really, uh, out there in art, certainly in modern art, um, from about 100 years ago. And it probably uh, describes pretty well how most of us feel about documentation. Because literally, everyone hates documentation. Uh, all of you are probably here because you hate documentation. You hear from other developers how much they hate the documentation, as well as the documentation of things that they use every day. Um, and the truth is it's not even just coming from you know, your average everyday developer, it's coming from titans of industry, it's coming from Kent Beck. This is an interview I heard, or, or rather read, uh, not too long ago, uh, where he describes something that we see all the time. You know, projects start with these you know, ambitious ideals for we're gonna do it right, um, and then you know, real life hits, business hits, and just, it just doesn't happen. Um, and he said, you know, let's learn from, from the experiences that we have as we do our, our jobs. Uh, and let's use that to iterate. So maybe people just don't maintain detailed documentation because it isn't actually a good idea. And he has this just delicious way of, of expressing it, uh, where he says, if it, if it hurts running your head into a brick wall over and over, stop running your head into a brick wall. Uh, and and uh, I think that's probably sort of the, the, the feeling that most of us have about documentation is it just hurts so much. Um, it hurts to, to create, to maintain. Uh, and the truth is it's not just Kent Beck, it's also all of the other signatories on the Agile Manifesto who explicit, explicitly wrote as one of the four guiding principles, we want working software over comprehensive documentation. They set up a dialectical tension between the two. You can have your working software, you can have your comprehensive documentation, but you can't have both. No way. Uh, well, I'm apparently very, very greedy, I wanna have both. I wanna have working software, I wanna have comprehensive documentation. I don't think it's unrealistic, despite the collective wisdom of whoever was there at Snowbird in 2001 when they wrote that manifesto. Um, and I think there are three reasons why I'm not crazy. Uh, I don't think it's crazy to, to say, why don't we have both? And maybe people will celebrate you too if you, <laughs> if you, I don't know, want both in the right way. Number one is I don't think that the kind of documentation that these, uh, these, uh, these sources are talking about is, is the same kind of documentation that we're gonna talk about today. Today I'm talking mainly about API documentation, specifically JSON APIs. Um, the ideas are applicable to a lot of other, uh, a lot of other kinds of, of tools, but uh, we are gonna mainly focus on APIs, so just throwing that out there. Um, so yeah, what we're talking about is usage documentation. That's the thing that you give to your users so that they're able to use the thing that you gave them. If they don't have that, they basically don't have working software because they can't use it. Uh, I think the kind of documentation that's uh, discouraged by these titans of industry is more about the implementation stuff. It's the UML diagrams, it's the big upfront design, it's the things that you're kind of building the system twice, once in theory and once in practice, and they said, let's cut out that waste, let's just build the system once. But the thing that you're giving your users is critical because without it, they don't have anything. But, you know, that's, that's my own thoughts. You don't have to listen to me. You can go to the doctor, the agile doctor. Uh, I don't know who this is, but um, someone who goes by the moniker agile doctor and registered the domain agile-doctor.com uh, said that it would have been better if they had written in the agile manifesto, uh, not working software over comprehensive documentation, but working software over comprehensive requirements and design documentation. That's the thing that everyone was railing against. Uh, so the same way that you know, code comments have gone by the wayside in, uh, for the most part in favor of self-documenting code, um, you know, upfront design has been replaced with, with uh, just-in-time design. So we, we've gotten rid of that kind of documentation, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today. Even if you don't buy what I just said, um, it's, you know, it's not the same kind of burden, or at least doesn't have to be, when you think about it as rather than this wall that stands in your way, an extra box to check every time you launch a new feature, or change anything, what if it was the tool? What if, what if it's not a brick wall you run into, but something, that, a vehicle that helps you move, move forward faster and to, to get to a better place? That's, that's the kind of workflow I'm gonna to describe today. 
And the last thing is, like, if you're here at this talk, even if you don't buy anything I set up until now, you probably need documentation anyway. So uh, hopefully you'll join me for the ride and we'll talk about how you can have a better experience with your docs. So if we're gonna figure out this problem, we're gonna solve it, we have to start by understanding it. And we have to ask the question, why? Why is it so difficult to produce accurate documentation? And I'm gonna go through sort of a few different ideas that I've heard over the years, uh, things that people say to try to explain why the documentation isn't as good as it could be on their projects. And uh, we'll just look at them one by one and see what we can come up with. So the first thing, of course, that we turn to is human error. Um, human error, by the way, is never the problem, by which I mean it's always the problem, but it's not a solvable problem because we will always be humans and so we will always make errors. So if you blame a problem on human error, you can't solve it. We have to blame it on something that we actually can solve. We will always be forgetful. Um, and you know, when, when we take this approach of like, let's just get better, we're gonna decide to do it, it works about as well as the average New Year's resolution. Um, raise your hand if you've ever actually like gone through and, and stuck with the New Year's resolution. Okay, like a couple. Raise your hand if you've not gone through with a New Year's resolution. Right, so a whole lot more hands. Uh, that's about how well this works. Okay, uh, let's find something else where we can actually start solving the problem. Our API is changing all the time. We're always adding new things, taking away things, changing what's there. How do we keep up? It's, it, it's a whole lot of, of churn. And this really starts to get at some of the issue. Um, but it has this uncomfortable thing for me where we're, we're again pitting the idea of change in your API against documentation. Either your API remains the same forever or your documentation is gonna be bad. Um, I'd like to have both, again. Um, but we're, we're gonna have to figure out a way to have documentation not be something that blocks change, but instead uh, is either a neutral or ideally a positive force towards helping us make the changes we need to make in our APIs. This is more of a psychological concern. Um, updating documentation is very mechanical. It's very straightforward. There's sort of a, a clear right answer and wrong answer. And that's annoying. We're, we're creative people. We like to think when we do our work. And we sort of like turn off our brains when we, when we open up uh, the documentation file to, to make changes. Ideally, if we wanna have documentation that's gonna work for us, we need to, uh, to go the opposite route and say, how can we look for ways where documentation can be actually a creative process? Here's a thing I hear sometimes, um, not so much from developers, but from maybe management, maybe in you know, talks or blog posts, things like that in the community. Um, rather than blaming human error, we blame human malice. You just don't care about your users. And if you cared about them, obviously you would write fantastic documentation. I just don't think it's true. I think it's really hard to write accurate, accurate documentation and it's not helpful and it's not correct to blame developers for the problem. I think what's probably at the root of it is complexity. We build extremely complex systems. There's a lot of moving pieces. Since the 1950s, the, uh, the generally accepted number for how many things we can keep in our heads at once is seven plus or minus two. So, try to find a single endpoint in your API that has less than that number of moving parts, you probably won't find one. You have uh, all, you know, all the various little details of all the inputs that you're doing. Of course, there's the, uh, there's the request method and there's the, the, the path and all the things that could be in the path and the query params. And uh, you know, of course, there's all the, all the different little bits of the, of the response. Of course, you're gonna, you're gonna make mistakes. We can't deal with complex systems and we have to just stop trying to do that. The thing that's not gonna work is guilt. You know, I'm, I'm just kind of tired of hearing uh, a lot of source in the, sources in the community trying to guilt developers into, into better documentation. Let's, let's stop talking about the problem and start talking about solutions. And the way we're actually gonna solve this realistically is we make it easier. We create the tools that will allow people to produce better documentation. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a system today that will actually help us to do that. And when we're thinking about what, what would that system even look like, the guiding principle has to be, let's not have to hold so much in our heads because the more we hold in our heads, the worse it's gonna end up being. So if we take that idea and push it to its, to its limit, right? what's the minimum amount that we might have to remember is zero. What if we didn't actually have to remember anything 
when we were writing our documentation. Well, it turns out there's this one weird trick. Other developers hate him. Uh, <laughs> you don't need to remember anything if you just write your documentation first. Now, I realize that I'm sort of playing a little bit of a game here because you're right. Fine, so I don't need to remember anything when I'm writing my documentation, but now I have to remember my documentation when I'm writing my code. And that's true. But think about how flipping the script changes the question, because now we're not talking about how to fix documentation anymore. We're talking about how to fix code. And that's important for two reasons. One is that that's how our users think of our software, frankly. Uh, they read our documentation. That's apparently what the software is. If the software doesn't do that, then the software is broken. The second reason is that we're, we're software developers. We have tools that we've developed over the years to help us uh, write accurate code and identify uh, regressions when they, when they pop up. Um, this particular community has, um, has, has pushed this particular tool ahead uh, in a number of years, uh, kind of raised raise that flag. It's the name of this track. Of course, I'm talking about testing. So if we have a test that fails until the code matches the documentation, we can actually write perfect documentation. So what we're gonna go through in the rest of this talk is the idea of documentation-driven development. And this is a term you'll hear out there on the internet. Uh, pretty much everyone is lying to you about it because when they talk about documentation-driven development, what they really mean is documentation-first development. And that's good, as we've mentioned, that's valuable. It helps you think more like your users, but it's not actually having your documentation drive your development. So it, it doesn't meet the, the, the literal definition of the term. And of course, it's also not as useful. So we're gonna talk about what happens when you create and when you update uh, your code. We're not gonna talk about deleting because that's a little bit more intuitive, so uh, you can probably figure that out on your own. So for a new endpoint, here's the process that you follow. The first thing that you're gonna do is document the endpoint. As soon as you document that endpoint, you need to have something that's driving you from there all the way to completion of your code. So you're gonna have a test that pops up and says, hey, you, you no longer have a fully tested documentation suite. <laughs> or, yeah. <laughs> um, so what, once you have that failing test, you're like, okay, great. So I, now I have to write a test that's actually going to um, test that particular endpoint. And as with any kind of blank driven development, write just enough code to make the test pass. Now, that's just one line, but that includes your entire current development process, right? So whether you're doing inside out, outside in, uh, whatever approach you're using to write your code, that's all in that one line. But everything is driven by that initial failing test, and you know that your, your coding is not complete as long as that, that test that you've written for that endpoint is failing. Okay, similar for a, a, a change to an endpoint. So first you update the documentation, immediately, uh, there's, there's one or more tests that fail because of the change, because things are no longer in sync, and you write just enough code to make the test pass. Okay, so that's, that's the, the flow that we're gonna go through. Uh, I just wanna contrast it with, with, with what most of us do, which I would describe as user-driven documentation updates. So here's how it works, uh, and probably you're all doing this so you recognize it. Uh, for a new endpoint, implement it, document it. I mean, you'll probably document it. You might forget, but probably. Um, and then a user files a bug report and says, hey, your API is broken. So you say, okay, great, I guess we have to update the docs. It's a similar process to change an endpoint. So you update the endpoint. Uh, because it's an update, so you're not in that same you know, mentality, you'll probably forget to update the documentation, or you might not even notice that something changed externally. Uh, and then again, a user will say, hey, your API is broken, and you'll go ahead and update your docs. Uh, so we don't like that. That causes a lot of pain there's a lot of bad feelings throughout that whole process, and uh, ideally, we'd like to escape it and, and come to a place that's a lot more healthy, both for us as developers and for the users of our APIs. Um, before we actually talk about documentation-driven development, I should probably say hi, introduce myself, because I haven't done that yet. So, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ariel. I'm a, uh, A.M. Kaplan on Twitter and GitHub. That's pretty much everywhere that matters on the internet these days. Um, I'm A.M. Kaplan.ninja. Uh, that's my site. I actually have a really long blog post. Uh, we're gonna go through kind of high level details about, about these tools today, but um, if you wanna see a whole lot more information, some, some gotchas and some pro tips, uh, check out my site. I have a very long blog post on the topic that'll help you out there. It's also probably easier to share that with your coworkers 
than to initially give them a 40 minute talk to sit through because they probably won't. I work at Vitals, so this whole row of people here pretty much, uh, almost the whole row, is uh, my coworkers there. Uh, we work in the, in the healthcare space, creating transparency around healthcare data. Uh, so we empower healthcare consumers, i.e. all of you, to make better decisions about your healthcare through, uh, through information on the cost and quality of your healthcare providers. So if that sounds cool or you like the content of this talk and the other two talks, uh, one on accessibility by Liz and then Gretchen right here gave a talk about our high school interns program. So if you thought that sounded cool and you might want to work with us, uh, let me know. I am DMable. That also applies to you over there on the uh, watch, watching on conference later on. I run this thing called Dead Empathy Book Club, which you may have heard of or you may have seen. I kind of littered the whole place with stickers. Uh, essentially, the idea is uh, to give people something concrete to do about developing uh, soft skills in, as they relate to a software development environment, um, and in general, just to kind of be better people. So uh, we do one book every two months or so. Uh, we have panel discussion. We have an open Slack channel. We have dedicated Slack chats uh, once a month. You can check it out on devempathybook.club. Uh, I would love to see you all there. Okay, one last thing. I don't like addressing hate on Ruby generally, and this is probably the last time I'll ever do that in a talk, but also the first time, um, but I kind of feel compelled to. So there's this uh, blog by someone who writes PHP and I guess is a murderer, I want to say, killer PHP, uh, called Why I Don't Believe in Ruby and You Shouldn't Either. And there was this line that I found to be just, just particularly delightful in a sort of ironic way. Um, he says, the only thing holding Ruby together was a hipster coder community of 20-something-year-old nerds who are now 30-something nerds. Well, for the next few months, and this is the last RailsConf where I can say this, I'm still a 20-something nerd. Um, so, all kidding aside, I mean, this is, this is an incredibly diverse community, uh, certainly in comparison to, to tech as a whole. Uh, I've, I've worked on a team where, you know, people have less, less years of, of development experience than I have fingers on a hand, and people who have been coding since the age of punch cards, um, and, and everyone's writing Ruby, and it, it's kind of representative of the community as a whole in, in, in many, across many axes, um, and it's really something special to be part of this community, and uh, just ignore the hate, which I failed to do today. <laughs> So uh, let's get down to business. How do we get started with documentation-driven development? Uh, and of course, as with every instruction manual, I'm gonna start with step two. Well, you probably think of this as step one, um, but you'll see why I have a step one later. Uh, step two is to create documentation that computers can read. It should also be documentation that human beings can read. Um, but you know, the, the, the thing here I'm trying to, to make clear is that it has to really be for both. There are many tools to do this. There are multiple tools to do the things I'm going to advocate for today. Um, so I'm just giving you enough information about one set of tools to, to I guess, to, to be dangerous, but you can go out and examine the market and, and choose for yourself. So Swagger, or as it's now been rebranded, OpenAPI, um, but it, people still call it Swagger, so I'm just going to call it Swagger, uh, is a, uh, a specification for writing JSON specifications for JSON APIs. Uh, bottom line, well, what all that means is that you write a bunch of JSON. You actually write it as YAML, generally. It's just easier to edit and to read. Um, but it, it describes the, the, the structure of your APIs, has a lot of places to insert things to explain to other human beings uh, what, what any endpoint is doing. Um, and then you get beautiful documentation that looks kind of like this. Uh, this is a Swagger Pet Store. You can see it at petstore.swagger.io, I believe. Um, and kind of get a sense of what Swagger documentation looks like. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to give you just enough information about what Swagger docs look like in order to understand the documentation testing part of it. Um, but this is, this is definitely not going to be a full walkthrough. We could be talking until next Rails conference, and still not be done. That is a huge specification. So just enough Swagger, the, a, a little bit, to understand the, the overall idea of, of how Swagger thinks of your APIs. So Swagger thinks of your APIs as on the top level, you have all your routes. You can see that slash ID in, uh, in curly braces. That's kind of like a uh, colon ID in Rails. It just means a dynamic segment in your URL. So you have all your routes on the top level. Beneath that, you have all the various HTTP request methods you might send to a route. So you can think of it as like, you, know, you have your collection and your individual, and then you know, what do you do with, uh, with regard to each uh, collection endpoint and with, or collection route and each, uh, each individual route. Um, and then there's all the response codes that each one could output. Uh, 
So that's kind of how things are organized from the top down. Let's take just one example, um, and uh, just, just for a little bit of context, I guess uh, the example we're gonna use here, you can see it's about packages. I don't mean software packages. I'm thinking of like physical packages that you might you know, send in the mail, something like that. Okay, so when you post a new package, um, you're trying to create a new package, and we have to tell the user, okay, when you're gonna do that, what information do I need to submit? What's the input to the API so that it knows exactly what to do? Then, if, it, if the request succeeds, I get a 201 back. Now I have to know what is the API going to tell me when the request succeeds. And finally, if it fails, and there could be a number of failures, in this case, we're always gonna use endpoints with just one failure, but there could be a whole bunch. Uh, what will the API tell me so I know how to move forward? All right, so here's how that looks in code. Uh, this is what a parameters object looks like. Hopefully it's visible on all, both of the monitors, and it was a little bit cut off before. Um, so in this case, we just have one single parameter in the body. Uh, it looks kind of like this. Uh, so you can see that it's, it says required true because this is going to be a required parameter. You can't submit a package without actually saying what, you know, what it is. Um, there's a human readable description package to insert into the system, and then schema is where we actually say, in the, in the case of a, of a um, adjacent object, what it's gonna contain. But we haven't actually said what it is because we have this ref thing here. And what ref does is basically, it, it says, look somewhere else in the documentation. Um, in this case, in the definition section, we have a package model that's gonna say what the package actually looks like. So again, on the bottom you can see in JSON what it looks like. It has a destination ID, length, width, height, and weight. So somewhere else in our docs that's referenced by that ref, we have our package model. So we have to list the required uh, attributes. And you, you'll note that weight is not required, so it's not like you just require all of them. You require only the things that are actually required. And then we have our various properties. And the properties will have a name, and then uh, what, what's the type? what is the format, and what's the description. So type and format are more for computers, but also like, you know, for you to, to read and understand. So destination ID, which is the canonical ID of the packet destination, has to be an integer of, in the format of a 64-bit int. Um, you know, length, width, and height, and weight, I guess, are all, in this case, numbers, and they're all floats. So pretty straightforward matches the stuff we have on the left. Uh, the last thing we need is, is to explain the responses. What are the possible outputs of the API? So in the 201 uh, status case, the package was successfully created. Again, we'll just get a package model back. Uh, in the case of an invalid package, it's a 422, and we have an error model to find somewhere else that will tell you like, what to expect in the case of an error. Again, trying to minimize how much code I'm gonna throw up here. So uh, again, our three questions. What do I put into the, into the API? That's our parameters. What happens if it goes well? That's our 201 response. And then if it goes badly, we have our 422 response defined over there. So let's just kind of crush this up a little bit. And we're gonna nest it under the route and the uh, request method. So on the top level, we have our route slash packages. Below that, we have post, which is the request method. And then a little bit of general information about that. And then again, we have our parameters and our responses. So exactly matching the format that we described earlier. This is the, uh, the Swagger editor. So I literally just copied and pasted the stuff uh, that I wrote on these slides right into here. And um, you can see how on the right, it immediately reflects that. This is editor.swagger.io if you're interested to, uh, to try it out. Um, and it immediately generates documentation that you would see in Swagger UI. So in this case, we just have one endpoint. If we open up that, that green line on the right, uh, that post to slash packages, we'll see something like this. So uh, right on top, there's a really cool button there to try it out, where essentially you just kind of fill in the params. It gives you uh, a skeleton to start with, and you can actually play around with it in your browser, which is really nice as someone developing against an API like that. Um, then you have your parameters and, and their descriptions. Uh, it fills in a bunch of zeros. You can give Swagger a more realistic uh, example to use, if you, if you so choose, and it's probably a good idea. And then on the right side, you see the responses. So you have your 201 on top with, with a sample response, what it might look like, and then on the bottom you have your 422 with an error string. Uh, of course, there's also another section on the bottom of the, um, of the documentation called the models. Uh, it's actually also inline. There are ways to look at it while you're still in the, in the individual requests. So we see our package model with all the information that we wrote about it. It's you know, the destination ID, that's a 64-bit integer, all the floating point numbers, et cetera, and of course their text descriptions. And one cool thing is uh, in a lot of these places where there's free text, you can actually write it in Markdown. 
um, and it'll just throw it up, you know, right, properly formatted on the, uh, on the screen. So that swagger, just again, enough to be dangerous, probably not enough to actually start using it uh, uh, immediately, but you know, there, there's plenty of, of documentation out there about swagger, um, which is a little meta documentation about documentation. Uh, anyway, go check it out. So step three, once we've set up our, our documentation, our computer readable documentation in step two, is to test it. And for that, the tool I've chosen to use is Apivore. Uh, it's a cute name, it, it's based on, there, there is an actual word apivore, it means a creature that eats bees, so kind of like herbivore eats plants, uh, carnivore eats meat, apivore eats bees, but I think it's, I don't know if it's, maybe it's pronounced API-vore, because the idea is it eats APIs, it digests them and understands them, uh, so it's pretty neat. Uh, here's how you set it up, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we include the apivore gem, you know, bundle install, gem apivore in your gem file, all, all the usual details. Uh, that's gonna give you this apivore swagger checker um, class, you have to tell it how to find your documentation, which means that you will need to set up an endpoint in your API that's serving up the, the documentation in JSON format. You will write one test to assert that all endpoint statuses are tested, which of course they're not, um, which, is, you know, which is kind of the point that it's gonna catch all the things that are, that are not tested yet. And then for every endpoint status combination, you write a test. So like any R, R spec test, you set up context, and then you tell your swagger checker what requests you're gonna make, what params to submit, and what status code to expect. So we're gonna go through all this in code, I just wanted to give you the, the overview of what we're doing right now. So here's the initial boilerplate. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, point to a few things. So on top, we're, again, we're telling Swagger Checker where is the documentation available so that I can read it and parse it and figure out what the API is supposed to look like. We have that one test, expect subject to validate all paths, uh, that basically says, okay, let's run all the other specs, and then once I do that one, um, or sorry, once I've done all that, I'm gonna run this one and assert that I've now tested everything, which again, you can see from the comment test go here, has not happened yet, and that's fine. In order for this to work, you have to use order defined, which uh, is our specs way of saying run these tests in order. You can, of course, uh, randomize the order of all your other tests, but you have to make sure that that one test that's kind of the, the spec of specs is going last. So if you put that into the API we, or we, we just created with, uh, um, you know, with that documentation, we'll see immediately we have a task list. So that's really useful for backfilling the API because it'll tell you, oh, you have a, a request, uh, a post request to slash packages, you have to test both the 201 and the 422 response codes and you can just kind of work your way down the list uh, writing tests as you go. So let's actually do that. Uh, let's do the happy path test first, the 201. So we're gonna set up valid params. Uh, Apivore has this underscore data uh, kind of magic param. There's a few of those for, for headers, for query params, um, different ways of, of passing different things. So you fill in just a, a, a reasonable set of, um, of parameters, and then you use rspec's implicit subject. So when I say it is expected to validate, that, that's the same as expect subject to validate, uh, but you don't then have to write any kind of string, so it just kind of lets you write a really, really condensed test. Um, so it's gonna validate a post request to the slash packages route, expect a 201 back, and here's the params you're gonna use to generate that 201, and we, of course, are implicitly asserting that the stuff that we get back matches our documentation. So we have one green, which means that we apparently at least implemented it correctly, uh, and we only have one test left to write. So let's do that failure path test. All we're gonna do is flip the length to a negative number, and we assert that now when we, when we make that request to post to slash packages, we get a 422 back, and again, uh, use these params, and we assume that it, that it matches the docs. Uh, apparently we did a good job, because everything went green. When you actually do this, you will not get to green nearly this quickly, because you will probably have a whole bunch of mistakes in your documentation. That's the point of the test, is to catch all those mistakes. Okay, so let's uh, talk about now creating a new endpoint. Again, our creates and our updates are the two major things we're gonna talk about. So in this case, we're now allowing you to update a package that already exists. So we're request to slash packages slash in curly braces dynamic segment ID. We're gonna make a patch request. We have the summary information on top. Uh, we have our parameters, which again is gonna be, a, 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 well, in this case, it's actually a package update model. You'll see why in one sec. And then we have our two response codes. In this case, it'll be a 200 and a 422. Our package update model you'll notice is the same as our package model, except for one thing, which is that there's no required line on top. Um, because when you're doing an update, like you don't have to update any particular 
uh, property, you can update whichever thing you want. So that kind of makes sense. Uh, and you can dry up a whole lot of this uh, using YAML. YAML has that thing with the ampersands that you can just kind of dry all this up and only write it once. So if you're, if you're worrying that you're gonna have to write a whole lot of code, that's actually not true, it's not a big deal. So immediately when we write this, um, our test suite is gonna complain, wait a minute, we have these two patch requests, a, a successful and an unsuccessful patch request that have not been tested. So again, the documentation is driving us uh, into the development now. So now we first have to write some, uh, some documentation tests. So we set up a package in our database, we create a package with valid params, and now we have that accessible to us in our tests. Uh, we're going to use that package's ID, uh, so anything that, um, that's a top-level param in, um, in Appivore refers to something that you're going to, uh, to put right into the, the path. So when, it, when, you, when you give it ID, it's gonna say, oh, there's this uh, ID and curly braces in your, uh, in your path, so we're just gonna substitute that in. Uh, but of course, then it knows that I look for packages slash ID and curly braces within the documentation in order to match things up. So we got our 200 on top, that's, that's gonna be, again, updating length in both cases, but in one case, it's a valid length, 8.3, so we're gonna um, expect a 200, and on the bottom we're doing a negative length, which doesn't make any sense to have a package with a negative length, so we expect a 422. And now you actually start your normal development workflow. I can't tell you what that looks like. Um, so uh, you're gonna have some kind of failure that's gonna be driving you through. Uh, it could be that there's no route for this. It could be that, that there's no controller action for this. Depending on what you've implemented so far, you're gonna have some kind of error. Um, and rather than teaching you all how to build a Rails app, I've decided to just kind of fast forward that and, uh, and uh, jump to the green. So eventually, once you finish your whole development workflow, you will get back to green, and that's how you know that you're ready to, uh, to do something else. How about an update? So we have our package model from before. Everything is the same. We're gonna just add one field, volume, right? Length times width times height. We've decided to calculate that on the back end, uh, and so there is now volume being returned from the API and we're gonna just add that to our required list up top. So uh, now we're expecting that every single endpoint that's returning a package is gonna have this extra volume property. As soon as you do this, you run your test suite and you get a whole bunch of failures that look like this. Anything that uses the package model now expected something else. Um, so in this case, you can see it says the error is that, that uh, it did not contain a required property of volume. Uh, as you're reading this, you might note that we have timestamps there, which is something that uh, we didn't even document, we didn't even think about. Um, and that's gonna happen a lot when you run these tests, you'll just notice like, oh, there's parts of this API I didn't think about, should they be there, should they not be there? Okay, uh, so that's pretty much the workflow of documentation-driven development with these tools. There's a couple caveats about, uh, about the tools, specifically with, with, App, with Appivore. Um, show you this slide for a while, I don't know how many of you noticed hasn't been updated in like a little over a year, uh, which for me as a, as a, uh, a daily user of this is pretty frustrating. Um, actually, it's, it's still on Swagger version two, Swagger's now on version three. <laughs> um, another thing I wanna focus on, it says that you can test your query parameters, so you can test the inputs to your API. Just kidding, you can't. <laughs> um, I submitted a GitHub issue like a while back for them to just like take that out of the description if they're not gonna do it, hasn't happened. So I don't know what the deal is. Um, but bottom line, uh, it's, it's not that well maintained. It's not a perfect tool, but it's still a, a massive improvement, and that's what I wanna convince you over the next couple of minutes that remain. Okay, which brings me to step one, finally. Convincing your manager or whoever decides how you use your time. Hopefully you have some autonomy over that, um, but whoever is, is making those decisions, convincing your manager or convincing yourself that you need documentation testing. So I like to travel back in time and uh, talk about how my team and I got started on using Swagger and Appivore. So back in October of 2015, uh, like I said, we're in the healthcare space. Uh, my team maintains a system that deals with patient ratings and reviews of doctors and facilities. So for, it's PRS for short, patient review system. It was rewritten uh, very quickly from PHP and Laravel over to Ruby and Rails. I wasn't part of this. I joined the team in May of 2016, so uh, I kind of inherited a lot of the confusion that kind of was already there. Um, a month later, we were getting close to launching with our first client, so we decided to use Swagger. We had to give them some kind of documentation. Swagger looked cool, so we decided to use it. it. Took us about a week to get that set up. 
uh, in July, we decided, yeah, you know, let's do this documentation, documentation testing thing, let's try it out. So I started writing these app for documentation tests. And instead of one week, it took until August 18th to, uh, to finish writing those tests. Um, and remember how I showed you that they were like these tiny little, very simple tests? So like, what took so long? <laughs> well, so just to be clear, again, this was 29 days. It was 18 pull requests. It was actually a whole lot of work. But the stat I think is really important is this. So we added 1,800 lines of code, which is again way too many, which kind of rings some, bell, rings some alarm bells in your head. And we deleted 2,700 lines of code through the process of documentation testing. So based on the workflow I showed, like that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like what took so long? What was going on that whole time? The answer is we were fixing a lot of broken things. Documentation, test, uh, documentation mistakes. That, that's what you'd expect doc testing to, uh, to come up with. Um, and we came up with a lot of those. But that actually turned out to be not the biggest use of our time. We had an API that was stuffed with a whole bunch of things that it didn't really need. Um, so like I, like I mentioned before on that slide, we have timestamps there. Should we even have those? Let's get rid of those if, if they're not necessary. There are some models that never change. Why return useless information, a timestamp that will never change? We had status codes that were just not the way that status codes are supposed to work. So a create action should always be a 201. We were returning 200 uh, in some cases. If we tried to send a delete request to a non-existent resource, it would 404. According to everything that I found on the internet, um, it should be either a 200 or a, 4, or a 410, depends who you ask, but for sure not a 404. We had routes that were just overcomplicated. And this sort of came about because we had, um, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a system for rating doctors. So you have like doctors, doctor ID, reviews ID. Well, what if that review ID is a valid ID, but it's not for that doctor? What kind of status should that return? And the answer was, why don't we just make the route more shallow, reviews ID? That way we don't have to answer that question. So that helped us get rid of, of, uh, of a certain amount of code. Um, we were a little bit inconsistent. So when you, when you write a review, you're, you know, you're submitting a whole bunch of answers to the, to the API. But then we had a whole set of routes for, for just editing individual answers. So are answers like attributes of a review or are they their own independent model? We were being inconsistent about it and we said let's just get rid of all those answer things. You can only delete it as, uh, sorry, you can, on, you can only edit an answer as part of a review. Um, we were mixing database concerns into the, into the external domain model. So we have uh, th this idea of you can flag a review, you can like it, you can dislike it. Um, we happen to implement it under the hood as a single concept in the, in the database, but like, why should the user have to deal with that? The user thinks of them as three distinct actions. They should be three distinct sets of endpoints. So we split them out. This is where it gets, starts to get a little bit nasty. So um, you were able to review a nothing. You didn't have to submit an idea of a thing that you're reviewing. What do you do with that even? What does that even mean? Uh, we, we started requiring that field. I, I don't even know how that happened, honestly. Um, we had this little problem where we're a multi-tenant system, and if you requested information, you could kind of get it for all the other clients, whichever client, uh, like any, any review ID basically was available to you. That was pretty bad. Um, so, so we started uh, properly scoping our permissions uh, because you know, some things were returning a 200 instead of a 404. There was an active, uh, active model validation that was just not working. Uh, you have to answer a certain set of questions in order to, to submit a review, um, except that the, the validation was failing. And so when I tried submitting without those, those required answers, um, it was not a 201. Sorry, it was not a, a 422. It was a 201. That, that wasn't right. So we fixed that. Um, and finally, there was some system level data that was accessible to all users, but should definitely not be able to be edited by just any user who, who feels like it. Uh, that was happening too, so we got rid of that. So that was a whole, a whole other set of endpoints that we were able to delete. So that's, that's a lot of where that you know, negative code came from. So if you have to convince your manager like, hey, I wanna do documentation testing, because it's cool, that's not gonna work. If you say, hey, here's a bunch of things that it could save you from, like client data exposure and insufficient limits on permissions, that, that might actually you know, get, get a response of, that sounds great, let's do it. And I wanna emphasize, this wasn't a team of, of like developers who didn't know what we were doing. Um, this is actually some pretty senior people who just made embarrassing mistakes because embarrassing mistakes happen. Um, and and you know, it was actually really good code. It was well organized. 
it was uh, you know, solid and dry and all the, all the acronyms you could think of. It was, it was quite pleasant to work with. There was really good test coverage, but we didn't always think about it from a design perspective because we weren't thinking about it from the outside. And when we started doing documentation testing, that forced us to start thinking about the API as a documentation user, otherwise known as a user. What's cool now is that as we move forward, when we're designing new things, we start by defining the impact on the users. So the takeaway uh, that I, I hope you can all uh, walk, you know, go home with is you can build a beautiful castle with just marvelous, wonderful, wonderful things in all the rooms, but it's not worth anything if you don't give people the key because they're just flying blind. Uh, I love this quote um, by Zach Supala. From the perspective of a user, if a feature is not documented, then it doesn't exist. And if a feature is documented incorrectly, then it's broken, right? Not the documentation is broken, but the feature itself is broken. The reason that this is the case is because users just see the documentation. That is their primary source of truth. They have nothing else to go by. It is their guide to making sense of your API. So rather than trying to fight it, rather than being annoyed by, oh, we have to update the users and do the documentation and whatever, let's embrace that. Let's start developing our APIs like we're users. Let's start seeing our documentation the way our users see it as basically that is our product and the entire code base from top to bottom is just an implementation detail. And maybe, just maybe, we'll build uh, APIs that are easier to work with, that are better for us in terms of, again, working with and in terms of de developing documentation we won't have all the frustration that we've gotten so used to. Thanks.